by a, a series of happy accidents, I found myself in the Mississippi State Archive digging through some WPA research. To my great astonishment, I discovered over 3,000 pieces of sheet music notated in the summer of 1936 by untrained field workers. It's a real potpourri of stuff. Pop tunes of the day, some straight off recordings like Ernest Stoneman's recording. Uh, a tune called Dark Eyes was collected five or six times. It's from, from the Republic of Georgia. I don't mean the state, I mean over there. Uh, Georgian folk song. Uh, a wild variety, you know, gospel stuff, just everything. And a lot of things that were not remotely folk music. Like I said, the field workers were untrained. Um, in and among this this pile of sheet music, which took me four or five trips down there to sort out, I discovered about 180 tunes that are fiddle tunes, or at least the collectors thought they were. Um, the book airs toward, and, and this has pushed me to do a book, which will be coming out in November, and I'll be screaming about it as loud as possible, and uh, when we're done this, uh, I'll have a sign-up sheet. If you want to give me email addresses, I'll let you know when it comes out. I'll be doing my best to let the entire world know. I love these tunes that we're going to play. I think they're distinctive um, and are fun to play. Some sort of them do present an initial puzzle. So these tunes are, that we'll be playing today, for the most part, uh, almost entirely, are from, from not the summer of 1936 collection. Most are from fiddle players that you would have no other knowledge of. I know very little about them. I'm in some cases not even sure it's their name because the records are, records are so poor that I have the collect. I have a name and it could be the collector, it could be the source. 1939, when they went back again, excited by this 1936 research, they did a superlative job. I mean, have photographs, little bios, drawings of their house floor plans in some case, interviews of their relatives, genealogy. I mean, it's very, very thorough job, and audio recordings, which I'm working with document to bring out all the 1939 recordings. There's 140 some odd banjo and fiddle uh, recordings to be a three CD set on document out around the same time. So all the tunes from this book that I'm working on, about 300 of them, will be available in some form or the other on my website, document, um, some form. Okay, I assume most everybody here plays some version of Old Molly Hair, indeed. Well, we're going to play the Mississippi version. Now, I think when it was written down, it might well have been the version we all play or something very close to it, so we could all just play it together. However, it's a D tune, and these, this is written notation. And in the notation, D, the key of D has two sharps. They only wrote one down. Therefore, Every time we encounter a C in this tune, instead of playing the expected C sharp, we're going to play C natural. So instead of, we're playing. Our guitar players, that's going to be a C major chord, and it's going to be modal for a moment. So be aware that um, the A chord you're expecting is a C. I'll play it slowly. In fact, I'll attempt to play slowly all afternoon so we can all jump in. But uh, the only note I really want you to get is that C. Everything else, you can play it like you would otherwise. So, P D, old Molly hair. Let me play it once so you might, so I can warm up since I just woke up. And so uh, you can hear where the C is. Yeah.
do the field recordings bear out what you're saying about uh, um, there are no field recordings from 1936. There okay. is only notation. But every version we have from elsewhere would be a similar type. Of well, you no, know, I do not operate under the assumption that if a tune is called Fisher's Hornbite, it will have any relationship no, to any other Molly version. Here. I'm sorry? I was talking about Old Molly here. Well, Old Molly, I'm not, the thing. name is meaningless as far as I'm concerned. Yes. And whatever happened is whatever happened. And Lord knows humans are different. So the, I, this is well within the bounds of plausible in my world. And it's well within the bounds of interesting and fun to do in my world. So at some point I don't care, except that it is the truth. It's what I've got. When the book comes out, I'm going to post the sound files. You want one of these chairs? Um, sheet music playing itself, little MIDI files, so that you can hear what the truth is. My, anything I play today are my best guess. And it took me a year playing these tunes to get them to feel musical to me because the dots don't tell you anything about slurs, accents, little breaths, and I, and I view this, the notation with a certain amount of suspicion anyway. And no sense of owing for it, since you had to exactly. just create your own. I have a question. Um, when you were trying to get notes to sound musical, because you had no reference to them in any recording, are you also listening to subsequent recordings of um, music from Mississippi in order to kind of like hear what the volume may have sounded? On one level, the fiddling from Mississippi is not technically distinct from the rest of the South. We're using all the same basic shuffles, slurs. There's a little, you know, and you, Carter Brothers and Son, for example, is, is kind of chainsaw bowing and striped down the middle of the road. Narmer is uh, on the upbeat almost all the time with his accents. He, he's a high wire act. He's much more bluesy and slight. There's a wide variety, so I don't actually think there is a state style other than a predisposition to being far more tolerant of tunes that are, I hate to say crooked, uh, because that implies that it's not right. There's, when you hear tunes of irregular length from other parts of the South, more so in than in Mississippi, it tends to be a repeated phrase, an extra beat, a clipped beat, and it feels more like a mistake from someone who views the world in units of four. In Mississippi, more, it's more often you hear a, a melodic phrase that just goes until it's done and stops. And it repeats, but the person playing it obviously is not counting and doesn't care. And it's more like a ballad singer. When I get done with the content, I'm done. I don't care if it has to be here, here, or there. And that seems to be a more organic part of the way the tunes are recom recombinated. <laughs> Um, I will play a Fisher's Hornpipe that I think is one of the more supreme examples of that later, once I get you warmed up. The 70s, so the total known variants, distinct versions, recordings, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of around 600. And I have ambition to have every last one of those notes crammed in my head and I'm going to fail, but I'm going to try. This is one of my real favorites of the collection. Um, it's a 12-bar tune. Rhythm players, I warn you. It, you're, it's going to take you a pass or two to figure out where the last beat is. And the last beat is what's going to keep you on your toes because you don't get to play it. It's, it's, a, it's one of the few instances where there's a quarter rest in the tune. And that is so atypical. I think it's incredibly important. So I'm not going to play it, and you're not going to play it. Um, as for the chords, it's firmly in the chord of D all the way through. So monochord tune. It's called Sweet Milk and Peaches. And no, it's not the Norma version. This comes from the playing of an African-American, Alvin Alsop, who lived in Teoc, Mississippi, which is a short distance from the county seat of Carroll County, my home county, where my mom was born, which is Carrollton. And I have been told, and true or not, I like the story, that it's about 10 miles from Carrollton, roughly, and it's just barely in the delta, in the flat part, and just up the ridge is Carrollton. And, um, I thought it was an Indian name, Tiak. Sounds exotic, but I've been told that it's an acronym and it stands for the tough end of Carrollton. <laughs> um, Willie Narmer was from that part of the world. I, my theory is maybe he heard this once and then and thought and was inspired to learn to play it, which in his case meant he remembered what key it was and he remembered the title, and that's it. D. We'll be in D until I announce a change. We have banjo players present. It's only right and proper I should do that. I'm hoping to get through two keys today. 
Uh, you guys get tired. Raise your hand and look wilted and we'll stop. <laughs> called Webb, which is uh, north of Jackson, which is kind of in the center of the state, between Jackson and Memphis, which is just outside the state. And he, he has some really nice tunes. Um, this, there's uh, four or five fiddlers that were, had tunes collected in, in quantity in 1936, and then others, there's just one or two tunes. This fellow had a batch of good tunes. This is uh, a uh, Billy and the Low Ground. Now, forget I told you that, because it won't help you at all with playing it. <laughs> There's a couple of really lovely Billy Low Grounds that, again, have no relationship other than the tunes that we might otherwise know. <laughs> <laughs> 